you will know that we have started officially back into our verse-by-verse -verse study through the book of Romans. We had a, an 11-week break where we, we got to the Christmas and New Year season, and so we came back last week and we started with an overview. We began with an overview of what it is that we had covered so far in our study, and so we did one sermon to do an overview of Romans chapter 1 right through to Romans chapter 5, all in one sermon. It took us 22 sermons to preach through that verse by verse, but we did an overview of that last week just to really bring our thoughts back up to speed. But as for today, we are picking up right where we left off in November, mid-November last year. We are beginning with Romans chapter 6. Now, <clears throat> in case you're wondering, Romans chapter 6, it actually marks the, the beginning of the third main section in the body of Paul's letter to the Romans, the third main section in Paul's body of the letter to the Romans. As mentioned last week, the first main section is found in chapter 1, verse 18, and it spans right through to chapter 3, verse 20. And the main theological truth that Paul wanted to get across in that section of the letter, it had to do with the truth that we call condemnation. And in that section, Paul explained why God's righteousness is needed. And the reason for why God's righteousness is needed is because we have all sinned and we have all fallen short of God's standard of perfection, and therefore we are deserving of God's just judgment of hell. And so the first section had to do with condemnation. The second section and the second main part of the body of Paul's letter, it started in chapter 3 verse 21 and went right to the end of Romans chapter 5. And the main theological truth that we find in that section of the letter has to do with the subject matter that we would call justification, moving from condemnation to justification. And in that section of justification, we see that Paul explains how God's righteousness is imputed. Now, what does that mean? Well, he explains that the righteous standing that we need as human beings to have a right relationship with God is the very standard which God himself provides to us. How is that even possible? Well, when a person places their faith in Jesus Christ, as talked about in communion and referred to in communion already this morning, somewhat of a, a great exchange takes place. Meaning that all of the sin that was our own was placed upon Jesus as though it was his own. And in return, we receive all of the righteousness that belongs to Christ, but that is attributed to us as though it were our own. It's a great exchange. Christ takes our sin, we receive his righteousness. And it's on this basis, on the basis of Christ's righteousness, God can declare that the person who puts their faith in Jesus is justified. In other words, he can declare on the basis of the righteousness of Jesus that we are guiltless, that we are without fault, but instead that we are righteous. And so that was kind of Paul's main idea in the second section of the body of his letter to the Romans, which leads us right up to today, the third section of the body of Paul's letter to the Romans. And in this third main section, Paul, his main focus really has to do with the theological truth that we call sanctification. He began with condemnation. He moved to justification. And this third theological truth that he is going to spend from chapter 6 right through to the end of chapter 8, it is all focused around this theological idea known as sanctification. In this section, Paul is going to explain how God's righteousness is imparted. With justification, it talks about how it's imputed. God's righteousness is imputed, meaning that it is attributed, it is accredited to us. But in the section of sanctification, he talks about how God's righteousness is imparted, meaning that his righteousness is worked out within our lives in the here and the now. He explains what difference God's righteousness makes to our lives in the here and the now. We could put it this way. Justification has to do with our heavenly position before God, whereas sanctification 
It has to do with our earthly practice before God. Justification has to do with being saved from the penalty of sin, which would be in the future, whereas sanctification has to do with being saved from the power of sin, which we get to experience here in the present. Now, it's very important, critically important, that we understand and that we correctly understand the theological truth of sanctification. Because what sanctification does is that it deals with God's purpose of salvation in the life of the believer right from the very time that they are converted until the time they enter into glory, into heaven with God. What sanctification does is that it explains how a Christian should live when it comes to dealing with sin and when it comes to becoming the sort of person that God wants us to be. Well, in today's study, we're going to be looking at the first two verses of Romans chapter 6. And what we're going to do here is that we just want to take some time, as the title of the study is today, we want to take some time to introduce ourselves or reintroduce ourselves to this theological truth that we call sanctification. In fact, we're going to be spending at least two studies in these first two verses. The first is today, and the next time we're studying, we'll also be coming back to these verses and looking at a different aspect of that. But for today, we are really going to be dividing the passage into two main parts. Our study is going to be split into two main parts. We're going to see, first of all, in verse 1, the partial understanding of justification. That's going to be in verse 1. And then we're going to move over to verse 2, And this is where we see the necessary understanding of sanctification. So the partial understanding of justification, verse 1, and the necessary understanding of sanctification, found in verse 2. And so let's just begin by giving our attention now, and this is where we put our heads into our Bibles, and we look to see what it is that the Apostle Paul has to say, beginning in verse 1, where we see the partial understanding of of justification. Notice how Paul puts it there in verse 1. He says it there in your Bibles. He says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Now, of course, this rhetorical question that Paul asks here in verse 1, it's directly connected to what it is that he's just said in the verses leading up to this point. So if we want to try to understand what it is that he's meaning in these verses, we have to understand what he's talking about leading up to this point. In fact, really what he says in verse 1, the question that he poses there in verse 1, it's directly connected to everything that he has just taught on the subject of justification. You see, what Paul is doing in verse 1 is that he is preempting somewhat of an objection when it comes to those who are starting to grasp the truth that we are justified by grace alone. He's, he's preempting an objection those, of those who first come to grasp the truth that a person is justified by God's grace and he is just, justified by faith alone. It's actually an objection that I personally love to hear. This objection comes up many times, and I love to hear this objection when it comes to a gospel conversation with an unbeliever. When I'm sharing the gospel with an unbeliever, I love to hear this kind of objection because what it tells me is that the person that I'm speaking to is starting to come to grips with what the Bible teaches concerning the grace of God. They are starting to understand that salvation is through Christ alone, received by faith alone, and that it comes about all by God's grace alone. Now, To properly understand the objection that Paul poses here in verse 1, we need to think back to the nature of justification. He's just finished talking about justification, and he has this, this question now, so we need to understand the nature of justification. Because when we think about the nature of justification, it helps us to understand why Paul would preempt this kind of question or objection in the first place. It helps us to understand why we will almost always hear some form of this objection when we are in a gospel conversation with an unbeliever, and when that unbeliever is starting to grasp the truth that salvation is by grace alone, and they're trying to think that through for themselves. And so let's think about it. 
let's think about the nature of justification. Let's think of what would be prompting Paul to even raise this question or raise this, ob- this preempting this objection in the first place. Let's think about the nature of justification by asking ourselves a few questions. Question number one, how is a person justified before God? As we know, a person is justified by taking God at his word, trusting that Jesus died upon the cross to take the punishment for our sin, which we deserve. Okay, great. Next question. What happens when a person responds to Christ or the gospel, you might say, with faith? What takes place? Well, as we talked about already, the great exchange takes place. All of our sin is placed upon Christ as though it was his own. All of Christ's righteousness is attributed to us as though it were our own. Next question. What does this tell us about the basis of our standing or the basis of our relationship with God? Well, it tells us that our standing before God is perfect because our standing before God is not based upon our own righteousness but instead it's based upon the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Okay then, is there any good work that I can do to improve my relationship before God as a believer? Is there anything I can do to improve that standing? The answer to that question is no, there is not. If your faith is in Jesus Christ, Your good works cannot improve your standing before God, not in the slightest, because your standing before God is not based upon you, but it's based upon Jesus Christ. And if your standing before God is based upon Jesus Christ and His righteousness, that means it is already perfect and you can't improve upon perfection. It is already completely perfect because it is based upon Christ's righteousness. Okay. Well, let's turn it over now. On the flip side, is there any sin that can diminish a believer's standing before God? Is there any sin that can be committed that would diminish or take away or deteriorate one's standing before God? Well, the answer to that question is no, there is not. If your faith is in Christ, your sins cannot diminish your standing before God. Why? Because your standing is not based upon you, but it's based upon Jesus Christ. And therefore, if your standing is based upon Jesus Christ and His righteousness, well, our standing before God remains perfectly intact despite the sins that we might commit. Therefore, therefore, it is impossible for a believer's standing before God to be diminished through the bad things that they do. Next question, how is it possible that God doesn't punish us for our sins that we commit both now and in the future? How is that even possible? Well, that really comes down to the extent of the atonement of Jesus upon the cross. When Jesus died upon the cross, he didn't just clear and pay for our sins in the past, but he paid for our sins in the both past, present, and future. Therefore, if, if our faith is in Christ, there is not a single sin that has gone unpunished within our lives, even if it hasn't even been committed yet. There is not a single sin that is unpunished. This means that there is not a single sin that can keep a believer out of heaven because Jesus has already paid for every sin, past, present, and future. And really, that's kind of what Paul is getting back, getting at. If you look at Romans chapter 5, verse 21, it's where he says, But where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. Because of Jesus Christ and his righteousness, there is not a sin that is unpunished in the life of the believer. Therefore, there is not a sin that can keep the believer out of heaven. Now, at this point, when people start to understand this wonderful truth, that salvation is by God's grace and by God's grace alone, they begin to think through the implications of this. In other words, they begin to think through, what does this mean? What does this mean for me? What does this mean for mankind? And many times when a person is beginning to 
wrestle with the implications of the truth that salvation is by grace alone, many times they can arrive at a wrong conclusion. They can arrive at a wrong implication. And by the way, this wrong implication is at the heart of Paul's objection and the question that he states here in verse 1. Paul is preempting a question from those who understand or are starting to understand the grace of God, but they are only understanding the grace of God in part. You see, when people draw a wrong implication about God's grace, they do so by reasoning to themselves in a similar kind of way, in 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 the following kind of way. They'll reason to themselves in this way. They'll say, hang on a second. If Jesus has already paid for every one of my sins, past, present, and future, and if my relationship before God is based upon Christ's righteousness and what He has done, not my own righteousness, then that must mean I have a license to do whatever I want. If Jesus has paid all of the fine, all of taken all the punishment, that must give me the ability to continue sinning and continuing in with a a sinful kind of lifestyle. After all, my good works don't contribute to my standing before God, and my bad works don't diminish my standing before God. It would seem that Jesus has made a way for me to be able to continue in a sinful lifestyle, yet not be punished for it. It's like the criminal who can just get out of jail free card. In fact, people might even take it a step further, and they would say, if anything, my sinful lifestyle is kind of helping God out. My sinful lifestyle helps God out because the more I sin, the more of God's grace can be on display. Now, I don't know about you, but when I'm having a gospel conversation with an unbeliever, and when they draw this kind of wrong conclusion or this wrong implication about God's grace— They're not drawing that incorrect implication because they think that it sounds correct. They're not saying, oh, great, this is, I guess, this is the way it is. They're not doing that. If anything, they communicate this kind of conclusion or objection, you might want to call it, because there's something about it that just doesn't sound right to them. And we know it doesn't sound right, do we? Don't we? We know that to say that Jesus paid for our sins so that we can continue sinning and continuing to do that which is wrong, there's something in that that just doesn't sit well with us, and that's correct. Those who draw this incorrect conclusion are correct, but they just haven't drawn a correct conclusion, biblically speaking. Yes, they have understood God's grace, but they have only understood God's grace in part. And what they don't yet understand is simply this. Now, hear this. This is the missing part of the puzzle here. This is where the the implication, the wrong implication comes from, and this is what corrects the wrong implication. This is what's missing from their understanding when a person thinks God's grace gives me a license to sin and to continue sinning and to continue living a sinful lifestyle. This is the truth that they are missing. What they don't understand is that God has not only purposed to save our souls, but he has also purposed to change our lives. That's the truth that they're missing. Not only has God changed our hearts so that we can respond positively to the gospel of Jesus Christ, but that change of heart, it now enables us to live in a way that was different than before. And so how does Paul respond to this? How does Paul respond to the objection that he preempts here in verse 1 concerning the grace of God? How does Paul respond to the question of whether God's grace gives to, the, gives to us a license to continue living a sinful lifestyle? Well, there's no guesswork that's needed because he says it right next in verse 2. Notice in verse 1, he says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? But notice how he puts it there in your Bibles, the very next verse. What does he say in verse 2? He says, certainly not, exclamation mark. Meaning, I'm using very strong language here. Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Now at this point, Paul moves from the partial understanding of justification in verse 1 to now the necessary 
understanding of sanctification in verse 2. I mean, it's clear to see what Paul thinks of the idea that justification by faith somehow gives a person to, a license to continue sinning and living in a sinful lifestyle in the way that they always had. That big exclamation mark kind of tells you. And those words, certainly not, they tell you how he feels about that. Now, what Paul communicates in verse 2, this is critically important for us to understand. It is critically important. Because what Paul communicates is this. When a person is truly justified by faith alone, there will always, and I'll underline it in the air, do an underlining in the air kind of underline here. When a person is truly justified by faith alone, there will always, underline, be a change in terms of that person's relationship to sin. Have we got that? When a person is truly justified by faith alone, there will always, 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 always be a change in their hearts in terms of, a per, of that person's relationship to sin. Now, now what, how so? What kind of change? Well, a person's appetite and their desire for sin that once dominated their lives, it is replaced with something new. It's replaced with a new desire. And this new desire is a desire to please God. They want to please Him by living in obedience to His Word. This is what Paul means with that little phrase there in verse 2, when he says, died to sin. Meaning there, there's something different. There is something new which has taken place in terms of one's, the believer's relationship to sin. <clears throat> now, when Paul says that a believer has died to sin, there are a few things that it doesn't mean. Okay? There's a few things that he doesn't mean when he says, uses that phrase, died to sin. One thing that he doesn't mean is he's not saying that sin will no longer be present in our lives as believers. That's not what he means when he says, died to sin. There's another thing that he doesn't mean when he uses that phrase, died to sin, and that is that a believer will never be tempted by sin. No, believers are still tempted by sin. We still have sin present. We will still be tempted by sin. But instead, what Paul is saying here is that our old previous relationship with sin has now changed. Our old previous relationship with sin, it now ceases to exist in the way in which it once did. It is dead. It is done away with. And instead, God has replaced our old relationship with sin with something that is new, with something that is different. And in our next study, we're going to be spending the whole sermon focused on the theological truth that is called regeneration. So we can try to better understand that this change which God has brought about in the heart of the believer. So we'll spend the whole time talking about that. But as for now, the specific truth that we really want to be focused on for the rest of today's study is that God has purpose to bring about change in the believer's life in relation to sin. You see, <clears throat> sometimes we as Christians, we can think about God's plan of salvation in somewhat of a limited kind of way. We can think of it in a narrow, limited kind of way. We can think of salvation merely as saving one's soul from hell. Now, God's plan of salvation, God's plan of redemption, it certainly involves that. It involves saving us from the penalty of our sin. But we have to understand that God's plan in salvation is much broader than that. It's not just saving our souls from hell. God has not only purposed future deliverance from the penalty of our sin, but God has also purposed for present deliverance from the power of sin. There is something future, something which is a reality now that will be experienced in the future, deliverance from sin, the penalty of sin. But there is also something that He has purposed, and that is for us to experience present deliverance right now from the power of sin. God has only has not only purchased future salvation, but he's also purposed present transformation. We could put it that way. Now, to help us better understand this, I want us to just to take a moment to draw our attention to a passage in the Old Testament. It's a passage 
which is Ezekiel chapter 36. And I want to draw our attention there because in this passage, or a part of this passage anyway, God communicates or he foretells the nature of the new covenant. Now, the original context has to do with God communicating to the people of Israel, but it also directly applies to us today, given that we too, as Christians, are part of the new covenant, which has only been made possible through the blood of Jesus Christ. And so, Ezekiel 36, picking up in verse 24, this is what God communicates through the mouth of the prophet Ezekiel, concerning this change, or the broader view of his plan for salvation. He says, picking up in verse 24 of Ezekiel chapter 36, God says, For I will take you from among the nations, gather you out from all of your countries, and bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle you, uh, sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all of your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take out, take the heart of stone out of your flesh, and I'm going to give you a, a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and to do them. And he goes down talking a bit more about the promises, and then you get to Ezekiel chapter 30, uh, chapter 36, verse 38. And God gives a reason for why he's going to do all this. He says, then they shall know that I am the Lord. In other words, this is how I have purposed to glorify myself among the nations. And so what is God communicating in this Ezekiel 36 passage? What does he talk about when he's foretelling the new covenant that would be brought about through the blood of Jesus Christ? Well, we see firstly in verse 25, we see the promise of Forgiveness of sins. This is referenced where it talks about the sprinkling of water upon us, cleansing us from our filthiness. This refers to saving us from the penalty of sin. But then notice that the new covenant promise, it doesn't end there. The new covenant promise, it doesn't end with just saving us from the judgment of hell. But instead, God tells us that he is going to give to us a new heart, and that this new heart would be different than the old heart. That old heart was made out of stone. What does he mean it was made out of stone? Well, we're told elsewhere in Scripture, stone of the heart, it refers to a heart which is hardened. A, a, A heart of stone is a heart that is resistant to the things of God, not compliant to the things of God hates the things of God. That is the stone of heart, uh, uh, the, the heart of stone. The stone of heart. There you go. Jason's living translation. The heart of stone. And, and what does God say in the Ezekiel of what he's going to do? He's going to take that heart out, take that heart that is, uh, is of stone, that is resistant, that is non-compliant, that is hardened to the things of God. He is going to remove that from us. And what does he do? He places in there a new heart. Not a heart of stone, but a heart of flesh. And then he doesn't stop there. Notice it that he says in Ezekiel that he, God will then put his spirit within us. Now, here's the question. To what end does God do this? To what end does God remove our, our heart of stone, cleanse us of our sin, remove our heart of stone, put a new heart within us, and put his spirit within us? What is the purpose, in other words, We've already seen that we've been saved from the penalty of sin. That was through the forgiveness. That was through the cleansing by the water, as he says there. But to what purpose has he given us a new heart? What purpose has he given to us his Holy Spirit? Well, notice what it says there in verse 27. God says that through this inner spiritual transformation, new heart, God's Spirit, through this inner spiritual transformation, it will cause us to walk in the statutes of God and keep the judgments of God and to do them. Do we know what this means? Statutes and judgments are just another way of saying God's word. In other words, God is saying that he will 
transform his people from within. And as a result of that inner transformation, this inner transformation will cause them to walk in obedience to his word. That is the promise. Now, do we see the broader objective or the broader purpose of God's plan of salvation or God's plan of redemption? Again, God has purposed not only to save our souls, but he's also purposed to change our lives. And in case you're wondering, the theological term that we use to describe this, the theological term that we use to describe the the change in the life of the believer following the spiritual transformation within us, that is where the term sanctification comes into it. It just describes the inner change and transformation and what comes as the result of that. It describes what we see foretold by God in Ezekiel 36, when the new heart is given, when the spirit is given, so that we can walk according to the word of God. Now, what is sanctification? We've kind of touched around the outside of of, of a little bit there, but I want to give us a definition. And as with the definition of justification, it, it might be a little bit wordy for some of us, and I kind of apologize in part, in advance, but what I, I say in part, because as we go through our study of Romans, this definition will become more and more, um, bring more and more understanding, and we'll understand why each word is used in this particular definition. So when we're using the word sanctification in our study of Romans 6 to 8, what, on, what exactly are we actually talking about? Well, by way of definition, we can say this. Sanctification is the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer, progressively transforming them into the image of Christ by subduing the power of sin and enabling them to bear the fruit of obedience. Did I read it slow enough? I mean, come on, Jason, this is not elementary you know, school here. It's not primary school. I know it's not, but I'm just, you know, giving us a chance for our thoughts to catch up. Sanctification is the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer, progressively transforming them into the image of Jesus Christ, subduing and doing this by subduing the power of sin and enabling them to bear the fruit of obedience. Now, this is how we can define sanctification. And again, we'll appreciate the specific wording as we continue in the months to come on the specific subject. But moving now from the definition of sanctification, it might be helpful by way of introduction just to try to, I don't mean this is my introduction that I'm speaking right now, but I'm saying the whole sermon's the introduction to sanctification. So Jason, are you at your introduction to the sermon? You're looking at your watch here. No, introducing the idea to us or reintroducing the idea of sanctification It might be helpful for us to now contrast between justification and sanctification. It can bring, hopefully, some a little bit more clarity as how the two are different. Because although justification and sanctification are what we can call intimately connected, it is critical, and I'll say the word critical again, it is critical for sound theology that we don't get those two mixed up. It is critical. It is critical for sound theology that we don't allow sanctification, the change of life, to somehow collapse into justification, which has to do with our legal standing before God. It's, it's critically important that we don't do that. Because if we do that, do you, know where, do you want to know where you end up? You end up in the place of Roman Catholic theology. Roman Catholic theology makes no distinction between justification and sanctification They see the two merge together. You are saved, in other words, by what you do. And that's a a, a significant difference, not only in theology, but that's also a significant difference when it comes to the gospel of Jesus Christ. If we confuse the two, if we confuse justification with sanctification, we fundamentally undermine the gospel because it'll cause us to think that the way that we live or the changes in our lives is the basis of our relationship with God, rather than the basis being Christ and His righteousness alone. And so there's a lot at stake 
when it comes to biblical clarity between justification, how we are declared righteous before God, and sanctification, what sort of righteous changes we can expect in our lives as a follower of God. So let's just take a moment to contrast the two. Uh, I'm not too sure how they're going to pop up on screen behind us there, but we will see. Justification. <clears throat> One hand, with justification... It is a one-time legal declaration of righteousness that defines a man's legal standing before God. That is justification. Sanctification, on the other hand, is the gradual, ongoing transformation of the believer's nature. Can you see the contrast? Another contrast. With justification, Christ has secured legal righteousness for the believer... Whereas sanctification is the Spirit progressively working practical righteousness in the believer. Another difference. A third difference would be justification is righteousness from God, which is imputed, accredited, attributed to the believer. Whereas with sanctification, righteousness, it's righteousness from God that is imparted to the believer. In other words, God's righteousness is now being worked out in a practical way within the life of the believer. With justification, that is the foundation of the believer's relationship with God. Sanctification, it is the fruit of the believer's relationship with God. The foundation, the fruit. Another one would be justification is what God declares about a believer, whereas Sanctification is what God changes in the life of the believer. Justification is instantaneous. It's an instantaneous change which begins the Christian life. It is what God declares about us, whereas sanctification is a gradual, progressive change that continues in the believer's life, right throughout the believer's life. With justification, sin will not diminish a believer's union with God, that union remains intact, but in sanctification, sin will diminish a believer's communion with God, meaning that sin can form a barrier in terms of communion, but not union. There's a difference between the two. With justification, God delivers us from the penalty of sin. Sanctification, He delivers us from the power of sin. Justification is what we can call monogistic. In other words, God brings about our standing before Him without any cooperation on our part. It is something that He alone and independently declares, and when He declares that, it is true. That is what takes place. But sanctification, how we change to become more like Jesus, is not monogistic. It's not, not we just stand there and do nothing and contribute and participate in no way and just let it happen to us. But instead, sanctification is synergistic, meaning that God brings it about with cooperation on our part. And don't worry, that's a really important part, and we will be expanding on this so we know what is God's part and what is man's part in future studies. But for now, justification is monogistic, sanctification is synergistic. Now, there are other contrasts that could be made, but hopefully this is starting to kind of help our understanding when it comes to seeing the differences between justification and sanctification. These differences will become increasingly important as the weeks go on, especially when we're talking about dealing with sin in our lives, especially when it comes to where we fall short in our lives. If a believer gets those two mixed up, if they think that they, they sin and they do wrong, and then they think to themselves, well, now I need to get right with God because my standing before Him is destroyed. Now I need to go and ask for forgiveness of sins because if I don't, I'm going to go to hell. They're getting justification and sanctification mixed up. And so these differences become increasingly important as we think about the failures of sin within our lives as Christians. Well, <clears throat> I just want to finish today's study really by looking very, very, very briefly at the different types of sanctification. The different types of sanctification. Um, you, just, just different types of what God has done, what God is doing, and what God will do. Now the word sanctification, or should I say the root word of sanctification, is the word 
sanctify. And you know what sanctify means? It just means to be set apart, just like perhaps your toothbrush. <laughs> this is set apart. No one wants to use this thing. No one wants to use that thing. Yeah, it's set apart for a specific purpose. It belongs to me. There it is, set apart. Sanctification, being set apart. And according to Scripture, there are three stages in which the believer is set apart for God. Three stages of being set apart by God. Now, what are these three stages, you might want to call it, in a believer's sanctification? Well, there is first what we can call positional sanctification. Positional sanctification. By the way, the three of them are all going to start with P. Hopefully make it memorable for us. Positional sanctification. For a believer, positional sanctification, being positionally set apart by God, that is something which is established in the past. That is established when God declares that we are righteous or just before Him. The very moment, that, that very moment, our position before God becomes set apart. We place our faith in Jesus. We become set apart, not as a child, a, a child of, of Satan, but instead a child of God. Positional sanctification has to do with our standing or our relationship with God. We are saved from the penalty of sin. That's the first one. Positional sanctification. Set apart when we are converted, when God justifies us. The second stage of sanctification is what we can call progressive sanctification. Not only positional, but next, progressive. And this type of sanctification is what we're going to be refer we're basically referred to right throughout this whole study. And this is what Paul's going to be talking about between Romans 6 to 8. Progressive sanctification begins at the time that God first justifies us, the very first time we become a Christian, right up until the time that we enter into heaven. In other words, it lasts our entire Christian lives while we are here on earth. That is progressive sanctification. And with progressive sanctification, the Holy Spirit progressively, or should I say gradually, changes our character, changes our nature, so that we become more and more like Jesus. This is important for us to understand. Because when a person becomes a Christian, they have to understand that they don't immediately transform into the exact person that God wants for them to be. When a person becomes a Christian, they still have sin in their lives. When a person becomes a Christian, they are still tempted by sin within their lives. And so it'll be this way until the time that we enter into heaven, which tells us what about ourselves? It tells us that all of us, regardless of who we are, none of us are perfected at this point, but we are all a work in progress. This is what it tells us. However, there's a big difference when it comes to sin and the life of a believer compared to sin and the life of an unbeliever. Although the presence of sin will continue to remain in the life of a believer right until we enter into heaven, we need to understand that the power of sin is broken immediately the moment that we become saved, the moment that we become a Christian. We could put it this way. As Christians, we will never be sinless this side of heaven, but over time, and by the grace of God, we will increasingly sin less as God changes us more into the image of Christ. Again, this is what is going to be made, talked about and expanded upon in Romans 6 to 8. And this, by the way, this is good news. It's good news that the power of sin has been broken in our lives as Christians. Because do you know what it means? It means that there, there can never be a time where a Christian can say, it's impossible for me to change. There is never a time in the life of a Christian where a Christian can say, there's no way I can overcome this sin or that. It means that there is never a time in the life of a Christian where they can say, this sin has got hold of me in such a way that there is nothing I can do to stop it. A Christian, biblically speaking, can never say that Simply because, biblically speaking, Christ has not only freed us from the penalty of sin, 
but also the power of sin as well, which leads us to the third and final stage of sanctification, being set apart. We started with, um, we, we, we started with the two Ps that we've um, looked at already. We've looked at, firstly, positional sanctification. We've looked at progressive sanctification. And there's a third P, and that is perfected sanctification. Scripture teaches that when we enter into heaven one day as Christians, we will not only be freed from the penalty of sin, we will not only be freed from the power of sin, but we will also be freed from the presence of sin, meaning that we will be perfectly sinless before God. In the meantime, as we take a step back and as we see what Scripture teaches about sanctification, we can rightly say this. We can rightly say, I have been sanctified, I am being sanctified, and I will one day be sanctified. It's a threefold kind of process. Three stages to God setting us apart. I'm be, I've been, I am being, and I will one day be. Past, present, and future. However, as mentioned, for the rest of Romans chapter 6 through to the end of Romans chapter 8, the primary focus is on that second P, progressive sanctification. That ongoing work of the Holy Spirit in our lives progressively transforming us into the image of Christ by subduing the power of sin and by bearing the fruit of obedience. Well, as we bring this study to a close today, we, we will be going back into verse 2 again in our next study. And we're going to be talking about in the next study, we're going to be trying to better understand how did God bring about this change in our lives? It's one thing to say I have been freed from the power of sin, but how is that even possible? How has God brought this about? And this is where the idea of regeneration or being born again really comes into the picture. When we correctly understand the doctrine of regeneration, it's going to help us to better understand the internal change which God has brought about to break the power of sin that once dominated our lives. More about that next time. But for now, as we bring the study to a close, let us reflect on some of the truths that we've seen today. In particular, let's reflect on the truth of sanctification. If you are here this morning, and if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, and if you are struggling with a particular sin or with particular sins, the good news for you is that there is hope. There is hope to have victory over that sin or those sins which has been granted to you by God through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so for you, if you are here this morning and you are struggling with a with particular sin or sins, well, be sure to listen intently and to really bring those before God in a very intentional kind of way in the, in the next weeks and months to follow as you can hear how to overcome that which now has a hold upon your life. There is hope for you if you are struggling with a particular sin at this particular time. If you're here this morning as a believer in Jesus Christ and you feel, let's say, at a loose end in terms of the purpose for your life, if you're thinking to yourself, what is the meaning of my life? What does God have for my life? Well, there is good news here. There is good news that there is purpose here for your lives. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3, Paul says this. He says, this is the will of God. In other words, this is one of the primary purposes for your life as a Christian. What is it? He says in 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, your sanctification. This is the will of God, your sanctification. You see, God is not only concerned about what we do, but he is equally concerned about who we are. What will bring much glory to God, biblically speaking, is not so much what we do, just busying ourselves, but what's going to bring most glory to God, biblically speaking, is who we are becoming. That's what Paul, uh, God foretold in Ezekiel chapter 36. He says, as my people become increasingly and be obedient to my word, as my people become increasingly turned into the image of God, image of Christ, that is what is going to bring most glory to God. 
And in a similar way, what God wants us to do is to, is to become increasingly evident, uh, and He wants to become increasingly evident in our lives. He wants to be focused on who we are becoming in Christ. And so in the weeks to come and months to come, be sure to listen very intently and discover God's will for your life. His will for your life as a believer is sanctification because when you change to become more like Jesus Christ, you bring much glory to Him. But finally, if you are here today and you are not yet a Christian, if you have not yet placed your faith in Jesus Christ, the good news is that change is possible. You may feel dissatisfied with your life right now, You may be looking around for something else in your life. However, what I can tell you is this. You will never find true purpose and true meaning for your life and the the meaning for your existence apart from a relationship with God. If you want to find true meaning, true purpose, true worth, it all starts with your relationship to God. And what's more, the wonderful news is, is that God has done all that is necessary in order for that to happen. You've heard the gospel here this morning, that you deserve the punishment of hell because that's what your sin deserves. However, Jesus, when he died upon the cross, he took the penalty, he took the punishment in your place, taking upon himself past sin, present sin, future sin. And so now you have a a responsibility to respond in a right way to what it is that Jesus has done. He rose again from the dead, and he is now offering to you the gift of the forgiveness of sins, the gift of eternal life in the future, but also a gift of transforming your life right here and now from within. But the way that you receive that gift is by receiving the gift like how you would receive any gift. You receive it by faith. You grab hold of it by faith. You grab hold of that gift by trusting in God's word, believing that what Jesus did on the cross on your behalf was actually done. And therefore, if you trust what Jesus did, you can have the forgiveness of sins. You can have the future of eternal life in heaven, not hell, but heaven. And you can have the hope of God changing your life right here, right now, giving you true hope, true purpose for your existence. And I would ask you and challenge you, why would you turn that away? Why would you hold a hand up to that and say, no, thank you? The creator of the universe offers to you right now the opportunity to find meaning, purpose, and change in your life in a way that you would never experience and in a way that you will never experience unless you first come to God on his terms. And that is trusting that what Jesus did in your place, taking the punishment for your sins, was necessary in order to have relationship with God. And I do encourage you today, if you have not responded to Jesus in that way, now is the time that you can do that. Now is the time that you can get right with your maker right here, right now. You can leave this hall this morning a different person. And so we pray and we trust and we hope that you do respond to God in that kind of way. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word to us this morning. Thank you that we get to be introduced to this wonderful truth of sanctification, that you have purposed to change our lives, and in doing so, bring much glory to yourself. Help us to have illumination and spiritual light to the truth that we see from scriptures as we study through them in the months to come, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.